it's interesting how they presented it because it's really how it is. There's a lot of Caucasians who worship uh, Egyptian deities mm -hmm. that those are our ancestors, mm -hmm. but they, for some reason, feel as though they would like to tap into that, the, the, the energy and the power that comes from those people and what they symbolize. Fresh killer. <laughs>
So we in deep. So you talk about like <laughs> our like our deities, our culture, and how our gods, and how um, you know white people feel like entitled to that. And maybe how do people feel in the show? It appeared to me I could have gotten it wrong once again. I was cramming by myself. It appeared as it appeared as though the, like the white people they had the magic and we had to get the magic from them. Am right. I am I correct on that? Like How we were people feel about that? Or another read is that we had it all along but didn't know. I mean, oh, for instance, yeah. you know, it was a hidden tradition and hidden power that was running through that familial line, but okay. it was only through their engagement with these white folks that they could actually reveal and clarify the powers that they had. Yes, Nicole. To, not to be like bogarting, but yeah, you can no, even ahead. think about there are certain aspects like of, of the history we do know about, right? Not mm -hmm. so much the things that we're learning in the last like five, six years that are coming to the surface. We're learning more about Black Wall Street and we're, we're uh, finding more about, um, you know, how Central Park was originally a thriving Black community where we had churches and banks and, and schools and they, uh, you know, they did this whole uh, institutionalized, I'm going to steal the land by changing the laws up on you. And we're learning more about that as those things start to come to the surface. But you can even think about like someone like Harriet Tubman. We all know she was so she's she's such a huge, huge, like powerful person as a part of the history we are being told, right? And and mm -hmm. we would all think like, how did she make that happen? How did she lead like over 300 people to safety as a woman? You know what I mean? And then even if you think about the Haitian revolution, mm -hmm. how did they overpower armies, French armies as mm -hmm. being slaves? How did they overpower them and get their freedom? There has to be black magic, you know what I mean? Black girl magic, you know what I mean? That's just what I think. Sorry. Well, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all go ahead. No, I appreciate it. No, keep keep that energy. <laughs> keep <it. laughs> Are you familiar with some of the work of um, Adrienne Marie Brown and the way that she talks about the casting of spells? I mean, I think that's kind of to your point, you know, that and I, you may, you can probably express this better than I can, but you know we have the ability with our words and with our focused attention and intention, especially when we come together, you know, I think as a people to, to cast spells and, you know, that's, that's part of magic. And I mean, I, you could, again, this is not the discussion on the election, but, you know, even some of the groundwork and the activism, you know, that's transformed places like, you know, Georgia. I mean, you could look at that as sort of this ability to collect, to collectively cast spells around what's possible. Right, and that's yeah. kind of where Afrofuturism comes in and meets with science fiction, meets with magic, is you know this ability to imagine a world that's very different than what we may see, and to to dream ourselves or to cast spells into that reality. Yeah, okay. I agree. Um, I, and I guess to 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 piggyback off of that, um, I guess you can put it in the aspect of like um, like a Baptist church that energy i'm not necessarily going to talk about the people who fall out because they may or they they feel something we don't know what they feel they could feel uh -huh. their own uh energetic level rising up or they could just be feeling the energy of the room you know how sometimes you walk into a room and it's a good vibe and you feel good automatically it's just like you instinctively pick up on it so yeah it could be something like that like where we all energetically kind of like are able to cast the spell in, in, in a sense by our thoughts and, and our words. Sure. Yeah. Nakia, Nakia yeah. you were wanting to get in. Go, go ahead, Nakia. Yeah, just to expound on both what Nicole and Nikki said, for me, um, the book of names throughout this series was the physical element, but the actual magic, the black magic, the black girl magic, just our collective magic was really in those conversations that those families and communities were having with each other. You know, it, it kind of made me cringe after every episode, like, oh, I wish you would just talk to each other. Like, if you just <laughs> exchange the information, you would know that you all are on the same collective mission, but they ultimately had to find that out over time. And so I think 
um, just the way we build on a grassroots level um, as a community, we get stronger when we share more, when we open up more, when we actually own our trauma instead of suppressing it. And so for me, um, there was so much of that going on, but that magic for me was just them sharing collectively and being open with each other about what was actually going on, no matter how outlandish it may have sound to the average person. Right. And so what, what exactly was the book of names? Help me out, guys. I know that the woman, they went back to Tulsa to get it. And the woman said, I've never actually read it. I, I, I never actually opened it, but I was told to protect it. Right. And she protected it for her entire life. Right. What exactly was the book of, 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 of names? Why was it so important? And I, I mean that honestly. So the book of names, I mean, is essentially, um, it's a book of spells, but it, it, really what it is, is it's like the way they presented it was that it's something that the grandmother of, was it the grandmother or great grandmother of, um, goodness gracious, why can't I think of his name? The main character. Atticus? <laughs> Atticus? Yeah, yeah Atticus. Right. Um, she she realized just being, uh, you know, a slave on that the the you know uh, the plantation of that of the of the the of the white Caucasian family who was trying to like hold on to that that piece of information that that specific set of knowledge. She realized that they didn't hold the power. They had the book, and they could cast the spells, but they needed her energy, they needed her, 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 um, they needed her to actually be able to perform the type of magic that they, the level of magic they were trying to reach. That's okay. why she ran up out of there with the book. You see mm. her over and over again in this, right. this dreamlike state that he goes yes. into. And then later on, um, you know, uh, Smollett, she goes into it as well. Um, Does the house originally remember burnt down for one time? And yeah. then the second right. time when, when um, Atticus, they, you know, was there and they tried to do the ritual with him, they originally tried to do the ritual with her. Mm. She got up out of there. She uh, snatched the book and, and, ha and hightailed it out of there. That's how the, the, the house had to be rebuilt from the first time because it was burnt down the first time when they tried to perform the ritual using her. She realized during the ritual, just like when Atticus was in the midst of the ritual and he has he's surrounded by all these uppity white dudes with rings he's in the middle he's the one creating this portal of magic they just are there feeding off of his energy what exactly was the ritual supposed to accomplish um I can't remember if it was immortality or if it was just like it was to go back in time to like when everything was perfect and you were order, everything was in perfect order. I mean, it was such a Eurocentric imagining of like yeah. before chaos ensued when the when the when there was universal order. Okay. So that was the Garden of Eden. That's when they were talking about the Garden of Eden, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's crazy. <laughs> that's, that's crazy, Nikki. Because that's just not how life is. Life isn't like that you know it's life isn't in order you mean how do you know what good is if you don't know what if you don't experience bad okay like okay. you gotta have that balance sort of that's like she said it's very eurocentric type thinking like i want to go back to when things are perfect mm. like mm -hmm. life just doesn't really work out like that because you really can't if you don't have if you don't have down times you can't enjoy the up okay. like the it's not as sweet Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's just how I think of it. It's like duality. I was also wondering how people felt about just the actual rendering of the story. I was so as far as the music is concerned, I was I was I was trying to get a hold of it. I guess I was um, I was watching it, trying to relate it to a precedent, right? Like something I've seen or experienced before where perhaps like I should not have done that because <laughs> I'm watching, I'm like, okay, bam, you know, 1950 story, uh, Southside Chicago, 
but then they were playing like hip hop music and contemporary things. And then even in the first episode, it's like, you know, they started, uh, they, they had the, the audio, the speech from James Baldwin when he's lecturing. And it was like all, all of these things, right? Like, so they were time traveling before they were actually time traveling in the story. And for me, I, I, I wanted to go with them. I wanted to just suspend my disbelief and go with the story, but something, I was having a hard time doing that. And I was wondering how um, did, any, did anyone else experience that or, or what are some other interpretations people have like of that, of, of like 2020 music in there and things that happen. Like in the second episode, they, uh, he's stepping into the mansions like, well, we're moving on up. And I'm thinking about it like, oh, okay, well the Jeffersons happened after, I was just like, is there part of my brain that I should be turning off now? Like how, I don't, like, this is not, I was, anyway, I was wondering like, did that, did, did anyone else notice that or, or was anyone else uh, impacted by, by that? I actually enjoyed it. I've seen uh, Misha Green's work, her and Journey Smollett before when uh, she produced Underground. So I was kind of accustomed to her blending different genres of music for different time periods. I particularly am a fan of it. I think it attracts uh, different generations and it's a way to pull people, you know, from all ages in. So I, I can still stay with the storyline um, despite the, the music because I, I was a little uh, interested in the music choices on some of them, but... Um, but overall, no, I, I think I, I had my preview of this with, with Misha's work, so I appreciated it. What 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 music what music choices uh did you did you question? Um I mean, in the literal sense, I understood what they were doing, but I, I didn't expect to hear Cardi B. I didn't expect to hear um the Jeffersons, you know what I'm saying? And so it was like, oh, okay, so this is where we're going. So I actually I had a good time with it. I enjoyed it too and didn't find it distracting and, and um, thought in some ways it enhanced the story. And, but I, there are other examples, like I think I, I didn't finish it, but I was watching the Madam C.J. Walker story, which was on Netflix and they sort of did the same thing, but actually I think the, they, they, everything was from the, like was sort of current music. And I, I thought it was just very distracting and pandering to kind of a, you know, so I've seen it done well, which I think Lovecraft did, and I've seen it done very poorly, which is what I've seen in a lot of other shows. Yeah. You know, not even just from musical selection, but from the standpoint of just, I thought that they were looking back on it through a 2020 lens, if, if, if that makes sense, right? And so I thought they were applying a lot of um, like how, how we politic and what's acceptable and how we look at history now and kind of applying it to that moment. Um, whereas I'm not exactly, they would have, I'm not sure they would have had some of the revelations that they had like in that moment in the 1950s or whenever it's supposed to take place. Um, I can think of like one example off top and I think it was when someone asked Atticus, oh, so you went to Florida uh, how was Florida? And he was like, it was segregated. And I was thinking like, but if your whole life has been segregated and all you've known is segregation, then would you label segregation, would you label it that way like in the moment? And so I was, I was like, I don't, I, I don't, I don't know. So there was, there were, there were moments like that for me. I don't, I don't know if anyone else had any, any of, any of those of those moments or not well I mean, I mean it kind of went both ways and i guess that i took i mean there was still more of an overt you know colored water fountain you know blacks aren't served here kind of segregation that was happening in florida than he would have experienced growing up even in the south side of chicago i think mm -hmm. um so that he may have made that distinction and there were other choices they made that i thought they actually consciously went to what would have been so for instance when atticus um discovered his father and I forget the guy's name that he had a relationship with um, mm -hmm. at the apartment, you know, and he didn't go to a place of understanding, you know, he called his father a faggot and, you know, kind of was very much in the, um, you know, homophobic kind of expectation that I would have thought would have gone along with that time. So, I mean, I don't think they had a, a modern rendering of you know, how Atticus would have reacted to having that revelation with his dad. 
Hmm. You don't think Atticus would have, would have had a uh, would have had a hard time, you know, in that situation in 2020? We still um, go ahead. I'm sorry. I I was just saying, as a community, uh, I still see that we still have that issue a little bit, like mm-hmm. accepting some of the family members who tend to show signs of that early in early age or or end up coming out you know they tend to get shunned a little bit from the family i don't think he would have necessarily used that language and i think if they were trying to soften it for you know modern ears they would have you know tried to you know have him not cast epithets and I, yeah I, I i don't know i don't think it would have presented quite the same way and that's intense that that was that was hardcore. What um, was hardcore? What do you mean? Say more. No, I mean like, well, well, let me let me say this, right? So I thought because they the South Side of Chicago has always been the hood, right? Like it's the hood, hood, the quintessential hood, right? South Side of Chicago, right? So as far as how they dealt with like queerness in general, they started in the first in the first episode. He went to he went to go get the uh, they went to the Denmark Vesey bar and he's like, is the guy the guy to be wearing the earrings, whatever? And then goes back there and he's having a, having relations like with a young with a male. I don't know how old he was, but with another male. And like he just brushes. He's just like, oh, you know. And then they just kind of keep talking, right? And I was like, oh snap, like, I, I don't, like, uh, like no shock. I mean, I, I, obviously he knew the guy was queer because he said the guy that wears earrings, right? So I was like, but if you, if you walk on that, if you walk upon that and you see that man, woman, whatever you are, I think that it would, I was expecting like more of a reaction, like, <laughs> yo, like, like even if, you know what? Even if it was a straight relationship though, even if you saw somebody pleasuring somebody else and you just walk in the back of the bar and be like yeah like it, but it was so like worked it in like hey man and they just start talking like, like you know, I mean, people were on top of each other i mean in the tenements and stuff and so i mean that's the version that comes to us through media but maybe honestly just like they talk about how there's been you know there's been lesbians and there's been gay folks you know who have been in our communities and it's been kind of an open secret or known i mean maybe that's what we expect from what we've seen from the media, but a more on the ground would have been like, yeah, that's, okay. yeah, that stuff happens. Let me give you guys a moment, but I don't know. Like where, where are we taking this assumption that, that, that the reaction would have been more out of pocket? I, don't know. Hmm. I think that his reaction was on, on point because based on what the other guy came and set, kind of whispered in his ear about his own father, that kind of took him back more than him walking in the alley and seeing the other guy getting pleasured by another man. Mm-hmm. I think that everyone in the community kind of always knew the, the, you know, light skinned gentleman that I don't know if he owned that bar, if he just worked there, right. um, that he was, you know, he kind of was like that. So I mm-hmm. think everyone in the community sort of knew he was like that. But I think that when the guy sort of whispered that about his father being the same way, that mm-hmm. took Atticus back a little bit, like, and so he's, you know, he's still watching his father, like, wait a minute. And then when it really was like obvious, he was like, oh, okay, that guy wasn't lying. Okay. Because of the man that Atticus is, and he's a, a war veteran, and he's mm-hmm. killed people, and before that, he was, you know, he was known about about his neighborhood. Um, I could see in 2020, 1950, in any time frame, I could see him really just not taking that well, you know, because mm-hmm. um, his his image means a lot, like how he is perceived by people. And where did, where did you get that sense that he cared about nurturing his image? Uh, I guess I got the sense from just the general, the way that he carried himself, um, the way that he walked about. I thought that he um, I don't know, maybe the fact that he had the relationship with Letty, who was presented as the prettiest girl there. Um, I don't know. I, I, would, I would assume that him being a, a, a man in that time around, around that place, that he would care about how, what people thought about him. 
I think that that would go into his, the way he responded to his father. Um, and he actually physically beat up his father. I thought, I thought that was an interesting aspect too. But you don't think so, Nicole? You don't, you don't think that he well, was- Well, it's interesting because the way he languaged it his, at that time, his hurt wasn't around what this would, how this would reflect on him as Atticus. His hurt was around, here you were all these years, you know, beating my ass, trying to turn me into a man when, yeah. So I think that's different. I mean, it was more the resentment of how he had, how Atticus had violence inflicted upon him when, you know, it was coming from this reactive place. So I don't, I, I didn't get that any of his anger was at a root of him seeing his father's diminished or it actually came from more of a place of, I think, personal wounding of like, how dare you? How dare you attack me for not being manly enough when this yeah I don't know but that but that but I think both of those things can be true like if he was attacked and, and hit on his bottom and then they show that for not being manly enough and then he becomes this super masculine war veteran that just kills people like that women at that then I think yeah. what his father thought about him what his father wanted him to be maybe he was presenting that in a very like you know in a very intense way um, so I, th I think, I think it was, I think that there were a lot of factors and I think that, um, I think that that's one of them. And like you said, I think that's correct as well, but I think that it's just like, it, you also, you, you question yourself as well, right? You question like, <sighs> I think when you find out something about that, about your father, um, and you want to be a man and you're a fighting man and you find out your father is, they use the word sissy also. He said, I ain't no sissy. He made that very clear when somebody asked him, right? And then you find out your father is, then I think that puts a lot of things, that throws a lot of things off. And I can see that, yeah, I can see that creating a problem for him or for that type of man or a lot of men in that time and this time as well. Didn't he find out that that really wasn't his father as well? There's that too. <laughs> so what, what about that, Saria? Um, that was pretty shocking. I mean, if I would have found that out, that somebody that, you know, I don't know. It depends on how he would have treated me, but I know he was upset. Like, it was his uncle, right? The guy that was his father. Yeah, the guy that got shot. And I think the, and person the guy that was his uncle always treated him as a son, but the one, you know, the one that he found out wasn't his dad treated him wrong. So I thought that was interesting. I thought the question of paternity was still questionable by the end of the <laughs> finale. I mean, the way the script was written was like, well, he could have been, he couldn't have been. I thought it was still up in the air. I, I want a little bit more on that aspect. And I don't think I needed the question answered for me, but I was more interested in his mother or like how she passed or like, what was this? story that that how did this happen you know what I mean the mother spoke to it did you guys peek that part she was just like uh she slid see, in there. <laughs> what did you say said again I said she slid it in there a little bit yeah they were on a couch I felt like she addressed it head on like she was she was just <laughs> like I she's basically like I love them both <laughs> like we're just, just like yo this shit is crazy <laughs> I was like, what? I, was, <laughs> I said, okay, mom, you know, what, I mean, what are you going to do? Like, but she was like, I love them both. And this is, this is what it is. They both are a part of you. That's, that's what and she that's what, Okay. <laughs> yeah. She did say that. Yeah. yeah. Um, Cause I know there was a lot about, there was a lot about black women doing what they wanted to do as opposed to what they were supposed to do. There was a line where, uh, so um, when uh, Ruby, when Ruby went to see him for the first time on Emmett Till's funeral and she left the funeral and she went to go see him. And he said, um, you know, he, she, she was, they got into an argument and he said, basically you came and you got exactly what you wanted. And I'm paraphrasing it. And I felt like maybe that was a, a an overarching theme in it, right? Like, 
Black women doing exactly what they want. Connecting that to the woman who, uh, Ty, I'm sorry, Atticus's mother, who was just not ashamed, just like, yo, like it is what it is. Like I love both of them. And I felt like that was an underlying theme, like black women doing um, what they, it, exactly what they wanted to do. Am I, am I off on that? Did anyone else pick up on that? I, I definitely think that was the running theme. Um, I think the person who, who ultimately still had that to find out was um, Hippolyta. I mean, she ultimately figured that out about herself when she started naming herself. But up until that point, I think she was still just kind of chilling in the background. But outside of her, I think every other girl, every other woman um, definitely was portrayed after going for what they wanted. Yeah. Yeah, Hippolyta was sort of staying in that uh, quintessential role of the uh, the woman of the, uh, what we would consider the woman of the past, uh, yeah. the, the postmodern woman, I guess, so to speak where she was in the home more so than uh, fig figuring and following what her heart and, and what it is that she, her passions and what she really wanted in life. Um, she was doing what society expected, not what she needed though. Yeah. Yeah, certainly for that time frame too, the modern, the 50s housewife, she's fit right into that classification yeah. yeah but it was good to see her at the end say push that aside <laughs> and, her, and, and like her 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 consciousness clicked on and she like it was it was wonderful to see that because it's like I think that's what we our community needs to see because I think that even nowadays we still struggle women and 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 some of them I mean I think as a community we struggle with that uh, we struggle with trying to live up to these expectations that society says are thing are, 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 are levels and and goals and 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 roles that we need to be in. But you know, we we don't really find our true happiness sometimes in in those in, in living that way. Hmm. And so it, I think it's good because, like you were saying about the different genres of music, if any black person in our community, whether young, old, or somewhere in between, were to stumble across this show, that you know they did use a different, uh, you know, different array of, of music to kind of maybe make someone think, oh, hmm, it's a little strange. The content isn't necessarily something I'd watch all the time. The plot isn't something I would really go for because you know sci-fi. You don't really think of sci-fi with blackness a lot of times. It's it hasn't been something we've really gravitated towards. So to hook people in with the music, that's like how, I mean, that's how we bond as a community. We all have a soul. So we, we, we share in that, you know? So I think that um, if an older person were to see a Hepolita go through that transition, that might make them more accepting of the younger people in their family. And, and some of the, things that they kind of look at and say that's odd that that's strange what you're into and I don't understand it but maybe respect it more and just support them not not you know you know you don't have to get really behind them 100% but just respect them and and not not tear each other down for wanting to maybe break the mold in in their own way you know ruby ruby confronted the what is the person that she was involved with? Um, the, the female version. She she approached the female version. What was the female version's name, guys? Christina. Yeah. Christina. Okay, for sure. So she she approached Christina about about Emmett Till about not you don't feel you know what he felt you know you can't you, you don't you don't understand basically. So okay, so help me out. They, so that, is that why she reenacted the murder of Emmett Till on herself? Is that, was there something more to that? Because when I watched that, I, I was like, yo, this is, what, what, what did people think about that? Like, that was a loaded scene, like. I, I think it served a few purposes. Um, I think from a 
narrative and storytelling perspective, it was pretty brilliant on terms of Misha Green in, in terms of, you know, having the violence that was inflicted on Emmett represented on screen, but without us as black people having to yet again, sort of witness, you know, this black body going through this just horrible death, right? So we got to see what happened to him, but we didn't have to see it happen to somebody that looked like us. And then I think from the standpoint of the story, uh, you know, I think it was always this debate, did I call her Christillium, the, the, the contractor, <laughs> but you know, was there really quote love there? I, I don't know, but in the moment, um, you know, I think she was kind of a cold fish and she was very calculating and she was actually always very transparent about what she wanted in terms of her agenda, Christillium. But I think she, in, in a, on a level perhaps, although maybe this changed in my assessment at the end of the show, it seemed like she really did care about Ruby. And so when Ruby appealed to her and said, hey, you know, you just don't get it. How can you understand? I think she really wanted to try to understand kind of what that pain was. And I, I don't think she was necessarily very equipped to be able to do that, but I think it was out of a sense of caring or desire to sort of meet that request or that longing that Ruby had to be able to connect emotionally with that experience. For me, yeah, in terms of uh, that that scene itself, um, I had to watch it twice because I, I had two sets of emotions. Um, she definitely got the abbreviated version and I'm glad they didn't get full into everything that happened to him. That still wasn't everything, but I don't think we all needed to relive that to Nicole's point. Um, I think it was interesting um, how the writers put the span of it being America's white woman, which is the most precious commodity to America itself. And so to have this done to a white woman, I think that made a lot of white folks uncomfortable, a lot of people, but um, I think that was the opportunity to say, well, now it's finally done to one of you and it's finally done to one that you put up on a pedestal. And so to watch that scene, I think that was a little gritty for people. But then I went back to, you know, her invulnerability allows her like any other white folk to, to walk away scot-free, she gets to get up, she gets to live. Emmett doesn't get to come home. He doesn't get to go back to Chicago. And so that kind of, I, I had a bunch of mixed emotions about, mm, did I like that? Did I not like that? You know what I mean? And so, um, and I think I'm still on the fence with it overall. Um, and just to piggyback on Nicole's last point about um, Christina and Ruby's relationship, I felt like um, she was very calculated. She definitely was transparent, but I think she did love her because she did honor everything that she promised her along the way. I think what they had in common was two women, um, obviously of different social classes and backgrounds, but they wanted what they wanted. And I think that was that genuine attraction throughout the whole series with them. But um, back to the whole Emmett Till thing, I, I was on the fence. I, I, don't, I don't think I had, I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah. And a way I kind of took away that it was very a opportunistic relationship for both of them because in 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 some s in, in some different perspectives, Ruby wanted to fit into Christina's world at one point. And then Christina always knew she was gonna need Ruby eventually for her own particular set of needs down the road. I think that Christina knew, she didn't know what she was going to need from Ruby, but she was going to need in some way Ruby to access something that she couldn't get in her, technically in her world or get close to somebody in, in her circle or her world. And I think that it was a very opportunistic relationship. Um, I, I think, <laughs> I don't really, I don't really think that Christina genuinely cared about Ruby. That's just how I looked at it. Because at the end, she killed her. Do we kill people we really like genuinely care and love? I don't think, I don't think so. Unless, <laughs> you were pretend, I mean, unless you were pretending the whole time to have feelings and, 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 and care for this person until they no longer served your purposes which mm. is like how the world works, whether it's in the 50s or 2020, people do it every day. So that's just how I saw it, I guess. Oh. Do, you, do you feel like that relationship 
before the murder, do you think that it was like even? Do you think who who do you think was getting the most out of that situation? I think it looked as though Ruby was getting more because physically she was able to transform back and forth between herself and this, you know, white woman to work at the department store that she was rejected and, mm -hmm. and barred from being a part of. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it was worth it. I don't feel that that was worth her life. I don't feel that her being able to have those privileges in the end surmounted to the value of her life. That's just me personally, but I, it, it looked as though she was physically getting what she needed. But in the end, she really wasn't. It's like she went to fit in so bad. And <laughs> when she saw that she was getting treated better as a white woman, you know, it made her feel like really bad. But that was crazy to me. Mm -hmm. It happens still wanted to be a redhead she still wanted to keep going she got yeah. a little drunk with power you know she wasn't quite done <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah I was it was yeah it was interesting you know how it started she 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 let the male version Christopher is that the male uh, yeah, right. William. <laughs> William. <laughs> so, yeah. I was combining them <laughs> like Nicole did. <laughs> but <laughs> she let William know off top in the bar that she was basically like insecure about who she was. Mm. And, um, and 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 yeah, and then and then it went down. And so she got that privilege. And I I felt Oh man, I, I felt like obviously the William Christina character was very manipulative off top. I was shocked how she took it so well that that it was actually, you know, a woman. I was just like, you know, like I anyway, that that was that was kind of that was that was jarring for me. But I guess I, the the desire was that, you know, to to be able to kind of, because uh, they spoke a lot about segregation, as I alluded to before, when they asked Atticus, how was Florida segregated? And so this whole thing about, you know, the white folk going to the South side and the, and the black folk going to the North side and whatnot. And so I guess that that was also like a theme that was, uh, that was interlaced like in several episodes. And she kind of um, was able to do both and, and, and be on both sides, which made her a really powerful figure. The, the aspect of colorism was real between Letty and Ruby. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't agree with, with Ruby's choices, but I could totally relate to, you know, the, the overweight, dark skinned sister versus the skinny, light, pretty sister who gets the boyfriend, who gets to have the baby in the family. I think Ruby wanted those things. Ruby wanted a life. She wanted to be seen. She wanted to be accepted. And um, though they didn't quite get into that, her wanting to appeal um, to that that white lens um, was very real to me. Um, so I, I thought the colorism piece, though they didn't spell it outright, I, I felt it, <laughs> you know. But they both were equally beautiful. I won't argue that. I, I think they are both, you know, phenomenal women. But um, but that's real. Colorism is is a real thing. And who gets to be pretty and who gets to win everything is it's just uh is there. <laughs> so all right. What do what do people want to see in season two? I want them to go back to the ancestral plane again. It sounded like they couldn't, but I, I really was feeling that. Um, I wanted to see some kings. I wanted to see some men in the ancestral plane. I, I loved how the women held it down, but I also um, wish that Tick wasn't the focal point or the only hero. I think the other men um, definitely played their part, but um, I wish that I, I could have gotten a, maybe some grandfathers, maybe some uncles, maybe some others. You know, I love the Tulsa episode. The men were just about it. They were ready, you know, and so I, I wanted to take them. <laughs> so, <laughs> let's conjure them up. Let's summon that up. So yeah, hopefully us just using our ability more um, in season two. So yeah. Can I ask a question? 
Yeah. What if, were the what if the um the little girls remember when the man cast the spell on the sis on the what's her name the jigaboos can y'all explain that a little bit I I know it was a spell and they kept following her but I kind of cabin was that a figment okay I'm gonna guess thank you Soraya but like the the girl <laughs> the girl they didn't actually exist this was something the girl was going crazy right. No, it was but a spell. It was, it was a spell. spell. A cop okay. did a spell on her. Okay. Yeah. Right. The sheriff, sheriff or something. Sheriff. Yeah. Or mm -hmm. whoever the police person. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. So that he was spit. He spit and and wiped his spit. Wiped his spit on her forehead. Remember when yeah. he spit? Mm -hmm. he was that was probably hurt. more troubling for me than the Emmett Till piece. Was that spit? Yeah. I did not, that was, that bothered me seriously. But oh, that's, God. that's part of like voodoo, hoodoo. That's, yeah. That was a curse. He put, he put a curse on her. And that's why after he did that, that's when you start to see the painting on the wall, the eyes are following her. And then she runs to the train station and that's when the actual, you know, hallucination, sort of begins it's popsy and bopsy it's the is i think what the the characters are but they're like um it's a play off of the book uncle tom's cabin there's a mm -hmm. character in in uncle tom's cabin that 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 uh those those two represent oh yeah and so, thank you so <laughs> so and so she was cutting herself what they were cutting her because something happened to her arms afterwards mm -hmm. what, they what, ultimately got yeah they ultimately caught up to her um and it psychological became physical yeah it became a whole thing which is why her arm was just kind of dead and, and no good yeah even yeah. those characters though were painful i mean knowing that um in mass media that's how we were portrayed and that whole black face and that menstrual era was a real and it's still a real thing the way mm -hmm. we were portrayed in cartoons and movies um i think that broke my heart to see them just kind of do that to d and to use those jigaboo characters um to kind of mess with her psychologically because i think that that still messes with so many of us psychologically um to be portrayed as people who are aloof and and um we're only obsessed with with money and cars and material things and we don't care about things when that is certainly a myth but um to see those images perpetuated down to the food you eat down to the cartoons you watch um just that whole menstrual era is just um was troubling for me to to watch her have to suffer like that especially knowing that she's like she's so talented uh yes. you know, diana was a very very talented with the uh her, her drawing skills and the comic book her her own comic book that she had um it you know it was kind of disheartening for her to have to have experienced that you know that that mental um stress put on her um but then again it was what brought out this underlying power magical power that was going through their family that no one really knew except for uh tick was kind of learning about and, and and was uncovering and uncle george was sort of privy to it until he got you know shot but you know that that part of the family who went to artem they they kind of started to realize there's something else to life that we didn't even know about so if if she maybe hadn't gone through that would you know would they all have come together why did the alien um connect with her at the end of uh season 10 are you talking about gia or or d at the end of season oh 10? yeah the so in my opinion i i think the the finale um i i wanted a little bit more maybe we need a 30 more minutes but that flashback went by so fast mm. I saw Tick introducing D to the the show goth, and I guess that was supposed to be her pet or or their introduction, so she could be comfortable and he wouldn't attack her, or, you know, protect her. But it was such a an odd thing. I wish they would have kind of filtered that out more because I didn't really pick up on it until I had to rewind. Like, well, how is it, she not tripping off this thing? Like coming at her, so you know. So I didn't get it, but yeah, I guess that was the intro to to her pet. Okay. <laughs> 
I didn't understand at the end why Dee was all by herself with the sugar. Like, had they all gone back somewhere Thank to you. the castle? Like, why was she just there to even choke Christina out? I didn't understand any of that. You would think after the child lost the arm and all that trauma, I was saying, why is Dee in this car even by herself before that? <laughs> like, stop leaving this baby. <laughs> So I guess hopefully they'll answer that. And then I think the the I think that was what they poured the salt down. Remember before oh, to protect her. I no to protect them. I think I think because he had the book, remember? They yeah. had the book at that point. And yeah. when they arrived in Artem, they had a plan. Right. But right. Dina threw a monkey wrench in the plan because she killed Ruby and then she imitated Ruby. Right, right. But they were putting down salt and salt in hoodoo, um, in hoodoo and voodoo is protection or to seal something off. Hmm. So technically uh, the, the monster that Chris, you know, that, uh, that Diana saw in the car, yeah. that was a black one. If you think about the earlier episodes, what episode one and episode mm -hmm. two, when we see those monsters, I hate to say it like that, but they were lighter. Go mm -hmm. back and if you go back and look at it, they were lighter. The one that in the end protected them, that was a black one. Mm. So yeah. technically that was from the spell that Atticus Kurt, uh, had, had put, had laid down prior to going to the burnt down remains of Titus, you know, Titus's home, Braithright, the Braithright Manor or whatever. Was that the one that Tick and Montrose did together? Yes. Okay. So that's Remember, what he handed it. Oh, okay. He handed, hit, handed it over to his dad and his dad said, good luck. He walked one way and he kept spray, he kept laying down the, he had a carton of Morton salt. Oh, sure did. He sure did. Yeah. So technically that was laying down protections for that just that general area so so i didn't understand um if tick was supposed to be gia's 100th or 99th like her foxtail story i thought that was pretty cool but but was tick the one that made her human was she human or was she not she never was human the asian lady yeah so so she so tick was it because she loved him because i thought he was number 100 or or 99 or whatever the number was supposed to be to get her past the threshold her and tick did get together so why didn't i, I think that's what threw me for a loop it was, it was a love right? I, I thought that it was supposed to be like she felt something for him and she couldn't kill him yeah. because even yeah. even though she had nine tailed him she yeah she, she could she wasn't successful. Okay. They came out, but oh, but I guess he kind of broke them off, and she tried to pull on them too, so mm -hmm. that it wouldn't take hold on him fully. Like it covered his eyes, but it didn't really sink into him and, and suck his, his soul, soul out, like we mm -hmm. saw the other men. Mm -hmm. See, and so I guess I thought her she would have been covered in his blood. Like, okay, okay, okay. But yeah, he was right. I think it was, and I think she said it, and. I think it was that he made her feel something that she never was able to feel before or something like that. It was some sort of love that she didn't know for a very long time, just based on her curse and based on the, the treatment her mother was giving her maybe, I, I don't know. He accepted her. Mm -hmm. I mean, he didn't know her, but he accepted her even though he didn't know her. I don't know, I guess, I don't know. He treated yeah. her kindly, didn't he? They did a little movie showing and all that stuff, like at the oh, base. Oh, yeah, that was sweet. Yeah, yeah. they did. Yeah. <laughs> you seem so skeptical of this relationship, Nikki. <laughs> I mean, did you guys not see what she did to the other guy? Like, but look, this is how, okay, this is my, got him. my adolescent <laughs> sense of humor, my <laughs> adolescent sense of humor went straight to a racial place. I was like, oh, <laughs> that's the first time with a black man. Okay, I see. I see what it is. <laughs> that black man magic. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>
she was like, I'm gonna let this one live. <laughs> she was holding it down. I'm gonna let this one live. Go ahead. Look. <laughs> It was only when he said he was gonna leave that she that the tails came out. Oh uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, hold up. <laughs> yeah. I, I, so, all right, one one final question for folk, man. One one final question. Remember the hood movies? I remember in the 1990s hood movies, and people were very critical of it because they were like, show an array of blackness, right? Like show black movie, and I'm sorry, so show black people with, with wealth and black people are nerds and this and that and the other. And then like, you know, we evolved into other things and, 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 and romantic pieces and other movies. And I was, now we are here 2020 uh, with Lovecraft. And I was wondering with this sci-fi and intelligent black people and hood black people and queer black people and uh, the, all, the whole array of blackness, is this, the kind of storytelling that we've been waiting for. It's or something it, different. It's something, it's something different. Because like I said, when I first saw it, I was like, um, what? But then I became interested and I, and I was hooked. So I think, yeah, it's something very different for us. Absolutely. I, I think we've been waiting on this. I think we've always been present, um, just having that exposure um, on us and having that level of visibility. But um, I definitely appreciate it, especially being able to, to see yourself in so many um, scenes and being able to relate to so many pieces. We're, we're everywhere. We've been everywhere. You know, this is nothing new, but um, I'm glad that this show is, is giving us the, the credit that we definitely deserve and, and the things that we, we built. Um, everybody's borrowing that. So, so it's nice to see our, our origins kind of come to life in this series. I think it's the show we didn't know we needed. Mm. Okay. I think that we all know and we've known there's we're destined for so much more all of us not just a small few that we that get handpicked you know to either be wealthy basketball football whatever sport team player or entertainer but i think we all have some power that that lies within us that needs to be awakened and uh, a show like this can kind of maybe make people think a little differently and maybe it'll spark a different um, approach to how they look at themselves or they look at the people in their community, um, how they look at their, their, um, their, uh, their own family members. Just like uh, Tick, he had to understand that when you went back to Tulsa, you see the dad and what he experienced that night. You, it, it, it might give you that sense of needing to have a little more compassion, not knowing what people have been through and what they've survived and why they are so hesitant and, and, uh, and why they, 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 they put themselves, they, cap, they, they put a cap on their own life because of fear, fear that's been implanted in our community in so many different ways. So I think it is something we, so a type of show we need to see more of. Well, for sure, appreciate you guys, man. Follow the YouTube channel, Awkward Black Tribe. We're going to be back tomorrow. We're talking about the election. So please stay tuned for that. Appreciate it. All right, guys, man, gone.